So, I mean, contextually, you know, the military is um, continually operating in chaos, right? You, you go in, you, you are using force to do something that another large body of people does not want you to do, and mm -hmm. that inherently creates chaos. So over, over the centuries of doing that, the military is emergent behaviors have come up in the military, which are a good fit for operating in chaos. In the 70s, 80s and 90s, a chap called John Boyd, who is a US Air Force pilot, began to go back over the literature and, and bring in a whole bunch of branches of science and social sciences. And the, the concept that he came up with was eventually, after sort of 30 years of iteration and, and refinement, the OODA loop. Um, and that for me, that's my kind of, you know, that's my fundamental abstraction for all of this stuff. It's where, it's where I go when I need to explain how entities interact with their environment. For those not familiar with the OODA loop, the, the OODA loop is an acronym for uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. And traditionally when you learn it from an article online, you might see a nice diagram with a, a big circle. Uh, but what I learned from Ben is that the OODA loop is not really a loop. And that, that kind of, that, that threw me for a loop. And suddenly the OODA loop, you realize how much more depth there is to that concept. Yeah, hundred percent. So I, I have started to think of the OODA loop as much more of a hierarchy. So if you, I mean, there is, there is a loop in there, but it's kind of like a, you know, if you consider a, um, an entity that is operating in its environment, it has a boundary and it has an inside and an outside, and it has a means to exchange information and energy with its environment. And the, the mechanism of that exchange is increasingly how I think the OODA loop is really set up. That's what it describes. So you have observations, which are things that you observe about your environment. Those feed into your orientation, which is your, your mental models, your view of the world, your understanding of the state of both you and, and the things that are around you. And then you have a decision point and an action. And you can really, really kind of consider those as the inward the inward flow of energy and the outward flow of energy. So the inward flow of energy is observation orientation. And then the outward flow of energy is, is an intention and a decision to, to take an action. And then that feeds into your observation about how, how well did that action stick? So it's comprised of multiple different OODA loops at every single stage of that. So, you know, if you're a company, you know, let's say you're a tech startup, your sort of macro organizational size, size OODA loop is, you know, the macroeconomic conditions, your mission, your purpose, the things that you are aiming to do in the world. But all of your people that, that comprise your organization, they will have their own kind of OODA loop. So, you know, a programmer who's working with a, with a compiler or, or, you know, doing, doing a kind of release cycle for his software, that's a separate kind of OODA loop. And they're all fractally composed together until you get this kind of whirling melee of, of interacting entities that, that form the kind of the whole. Well, yeah. I mean, we've all been in a situation where you're on a you're on a small team who seemingly doesn't have any contact with the outside world, and and suddenly you're making all sorts of weird decisions that all the maybe all the programmers are, are like, what is going on? And and no one is aligned, and it just feels crazy. You know, what what's one way that an organization can make sure that they're they're staying in contact with the external as they go through their their OODA loop, their OODA hierarchies? So that's a, that's a great observation. And yeah, you're right. That happens all the time. <clears throat> and in fact, um, so the OODA loop obviously was born of combat and what, what Boyd, so Boyd, uh, Boyd was a fighter pilot in the 1950s. He became an instructor at Top Gun. And when he was at Top Gun, he used to be able to, he used to have a bet that he could beat anyone in 40 seconds and he never lost apparently. Um, so the, so the legend goes and his process of winning is what he calls getting inside the OODA loop. Now that's, you know, if you've, if you've read anything about the OODA loop and you've read anything about one of these kind of surface levels article level articles, that's commonly represented or explained as just going faster, right? You just, you just tighten up your loop, you go faster than everyone else, but there's actually a lot more to it than that. What you want to do when, when you consider getting inside somebody's OODA loop, it's actually breaking their orientation. You're actually causing them to continually drift away from the, the, the reality. And the way you do that is by, I increasingly believe the way you do that is by walling off their observations and their, and their actions by forcing them to jump between orientation and decision. So you, you either overwhelm, overwhelm them with too many observations that they can't react to, or you, you just have them make decisions that they can't enact. So they're continually, oh, try this, try that, try that, but nothing ever sticks. And if you think about a fast moving tech company, that's actually sometimes what they do to themselves, right? They, 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 they grow from a small single, you know, single unit, <clears throat> say five, five to eight people, 
where everyone's in contact and everyone knows what's going on because there's this kind of process of osmosis. But then what happens is they grow. There's more communication overhead between those people, but they're still kind of, they're still anchored on the amount that they used to be able to deliver or the speed with which they used to be able to react when they were a small team. Mm -hmm. So they continue to try and do that. They continue to, to take on too much stuff. They, they don't reorientate on prioritizing the highest things and they try and do everything, which means that they end up basically, I mean, I, I've experienced this several times in tech companies. They end up really sub-optimizing their ability to deliver because they're continually doing this kind of bouncing back and forth of, you know, working on too many things and never pushing anything through. Yeah. Um, and that essentially is them building up entropy within their system. And it's, it, you know, it's a chaotic place to be and it's really frustrating, which is one of the reasons why I want to do what I want to do is to help get through that kind of friction.